Welcome everybody to the uh, Kudan Open Lab seminar. Um, so Kudan stands for Cultural Data Analytics, uh, for those uh, who don't know yet. Um, it's, um, we are an era chair project, which is uh, sort of a uh, innovation and research funding scheme of the European Union. It's sort of the same size as an ERC consolidator project, but our goal is to sort of like create the infrastructure to do research. And so our way we implement this is is why a research group. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the idea is to sort of like go beyond digital humanities and include um, sort of aspects of national social science in a more integrated way as they fit together. And uh, so one of the things I was very itchy and uh, happy about when I accepted this position or even like saw that it happened um, at uh, Tallinn University um, was obviously the knowledge in the back of our mind, uh, of my mind, that um, in Helsinki there is this cluster of network scientists. Um, and, you know, I was uh, thinking of Nico, I was thinking of Kim Okoski, I was thinking of, you know, like obviously the friends of Peter Holman. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and um, so my, my knowledge could be better, right? Um, so, the key thing is, um, I think there's a there's a really good opportunity to sort of like uh, get to know each other better, and uh, so we're very happy to return the favor. And so today we welcome Yari Sarameki and group with uh, Miko Kivula and group, um, and they promise to give us a kind of crash course in multi-layer networks and temporal networks, and then talk a little bit about like what everybody else is doing. So. We have a two hour time slot. The standard um, sort of rule of the game is, um, is uh, talk and then uh, maximize discussion, which can be interspersed or can be after that, depending on what the speakers prefer. Um, one thing um, I should basically say beforehand is there's a very weird um, relationship between cultural analytics or cultural history, humanities in general, and uh, this thing, multi-layer networks, which is um, where I was coming from. I was drowning in node and link types in these knowledge graphs and relational databases in the 90s. And when I was in, in Boston at Barabasi Lab, I would work, walk around with these like sort of like, you know, matrices of degree plots of different link types and nobody was interested. And so and then there was Shlomo Havlin in Israel saying, oh, there's the power grid and the internet and I do something together. And so uh, in 2009, they had this like great breakthrough, right? And Rice, Sousa, Elizabeth Leich, they were looking at two networks that interact with each other. So you have three link types, one here, one here, and the one in between. And so um, then this thing, multi-layer, multiplex, multi-dimensional, multi-partite, multi-whatever uh, happened. And in 2016, like following Miko's uh, review paper, at Paris, in at NetSci, I would say that was the moment when more than 50% of everything going on in network science was multi-layer networks. <laughs> and um, so I had a conversation recently with, uh, with Ginestra Bianconi, who also wrote a book on this, um, where one of the interesting things is we're still not there at the knowledge graph thing. There's still these things with 20,000 nodes and link types and nobody knows what to do. And so, uh, so we have those things. <laughs> <laughs> and we still like, cannot make sense of them. So there should be some gas left in the tank of things we can do to get in this direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah. If, so, yeah if, you, if your number of link types is of the same order as your number of links, yeah, and yeah, then things do get interesting. Yes. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, okay, uh, actually, yeah. Um, yeah, obviously, when they're still, they're still probably three, four orders of magnitude larger. That's the key thing, right? So. But one thing we, 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 we do um, see that there is lots of link types that should basically behave the same. And then we can forget about like many of them. So no, no longer uh, me rambling, um, Yari and Nico, the stage is yours. <laughs> okay, so yeah. Hi everyone and thanks Maxi for in this invitation. And we, we will certainly return the favor and ask you to, to drop by either either virtually or or in the real world, if we get, get to have such a situation in the near future. Um, cool, so I thought that um, 
I would first start with a short <clears throat> sort of overall introduction into temporal networks, just to give a quick idea of what, what, what that is. And then that would be about 20 minutes unless I start rambling too much, in which case it will be half an hour. And then uh, Mick could follow by a similar, similar talk about multi-layer graphs. And then we have three presentations that uh, from Javier and Shiren and Talaye about different aspects of, of shorter, shorter presentations about different aspects of things that our group does. We are super multidisciplinary and becoming even more multidisciplinary all the time. So, I mean, I've, I've, I'm, I'm st starting to worry myself because I'm, I'm, I get interested in everything. And so on top of the, all these things I do now, what it's like immunology and, and uh, evolution and, and whatnot. But so, yeah, that's probably part of, part of uh, why science is so much fun and why networks are so much fun because you can do so many things with them. Great, but so um, I'll share my screen, I guess. So this now, what's this? What are, what are you, are you seeing my screen? I'm seeing something else. Yes, we can, but we can see the PowerPoint um, interface. Right. Now, now it looks awesome. Thank you. OK, now you can see. Right. All right. So um, welcome to the wonderful world of temporal networks. So we'll start with answering the question, what are those? Um, we've already started now with networks. So you know that network science is, is a pretty powerful approach to almost anything. <clears throat> to complex systems at very many different different levels from from uh, those molecular systems that that actually are life the things that that make our cells tick to our nerve cells that, that make us think to the networks that we we build among to to be in touch with other human beings and the networks that we build to move around or move power around and so so forth so tons of different types of networks um, and this really strong thing about network science is that there is a mathematical framework a way of looking at things mathematically that allows scientists to study any of these objects even though they are rather different in terms of what they do or what domain of science they come from there is something that you can use to study any of such systems. Uh, but then the different types of systems come with their own peculiarities. They, they might need some methods that, or some, some ways of uh, looking at things that, that are not in the standard, so-called standard networks toolkit. And that's a bit reflected in the, in the evolution of network science. If we look at the early works, like about 20 years ago, everyone started with static and binary networks. So that was the point of view that we have, we have nodes and we have links, and then we try to understand what network structures, where do they come from? Uh, what sort of effects do they have on different types of processes that, that play out on top of networks? But then uh, when more and more data became available and when the problems keep became more and more complicated, people started looking at ways of adding more detail on top of the simplified picture. Uh, for example, as in weighted networks, where you use link weights that carry information about interaction strengths. This is say for, for any network that has uh, transport in it, like, like the network of air travel, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, otherwise you lose too much information or social networks of people if you can somehow somehow estimate the strengths of ties then this uh, idea of, of using the weights to better understand the system makes a lot of sense and then uh, the time domain also appeared at some point people started first looking into dynamic networks which would be networks where the link structure slowly changes, but links either are there or not. So, so links themselves do not contain any temporal structure. It's just that their, their composition, link composition changes. And then 
all these fairly fairly recent, well, not, not that recent any longer, frameworks that appeared about 10 years ago started emerging. Uh, temporal networks, the one that I'm going to be talking about, where you don't basically have links that are always on, but you have events, you have contacts, you have things like phone calls that con connect people instead of friendships that are more longer lasting. You have multi-layer networks that have been already mentioned. You have spatial networks and Shuren is going to talk a bit about that topic. And then of course you have a combination of all of this. For example, if we look at networks of say public transport, you have the temporal aspect, you have spatial, and you have multi-layer because of the different modalities. So all of these can be combined as well. So temporal networks, where did this, where, where did they come from? Uh, the emergence of, of the temporal networks framework was pretty much driven by data. So, so in the late 2000s, early 2010s, like 15, 20 years ago, uh, 15 to 10 years ago, uh, several types of data sets started emerging where, where all the connections and contacts interactions between, between mainly people, because most of these were some, somehow, somehow related to social interactions, were, came with timestamps so that, that there was information about who was in contact with whom and at what time. Phone calls, text messages, emails, different types of online interactions, also physical proximity from the social patterns project that has recorded, recorded uh, uh, with RFID sensors, who's close to whom at what point in time in conferences, hospitals, schools, and so on. So there was a lot of data that was available. And of course, people started playing around with data because that's, that's the key thing that network scientists do, they get new sets of data and then they, they try to figure out what's in the data and what, what one can learn from the data and if the data is about a network where some processes could be playing out, how would this network affect those processes, which was a very important question in the early days of temporal networks, that if you play some dynamics on a network where you don't have links that are permanently on but switch on and off at given times, how do those times and how does the temporal structure affect the dynamics of such processes. And so technically speaking, what are temporal networks? They are networks that consist of nodes and events. And events are like links that happen only at specified times or, at, or during specified time ranges. So when, when there is no event between two nodes, nothing can, no information or no, no influence can transfer between those, those two nodes. So everything has to happen when the nodes are interacting or in contact with one another. And the times of these events, of course, then determine a lot of things uh, like causal paths through which something can can travel in the system or some, through which influence can be transmitted in the system. And this makes our lives a bit more, as network scientists, our lives a bit more complicated because the simple representations at JCNZ or weight matrices or, or such things do no longer work. One has, to, one has to use other types of ways to look at these systems. And one of the key things that happens when you consider networks of events instead of networks of links is that you need to start considering time respecting paths that are sequences of events that respect the direction of time. Uh, this would be like I'm calling Mick or I'm sending an email to Mick or Mick is sending an email to Maxi. Then some information may flow from me to Maxi, but uh, if in that same in that same path, no information may flow from him to me because there's a direction, the arrow of time, unless he replies to me or replies to me and send an email back, sends an email back. Fine. And such temporal time respecting paths are nowadays, of course, of tremendous in, uh, uh, importance when we think of the ongoing pandemic, because these are the chains of transmission. These are the things that people try to track through through contact tracing. So, so these are the 
time respecting chains of infection that happen out there in the real world. So this is one, one thing that happens when you consider timed events. The concept of parts and who can, what can influence what becomes a bit different. And one can even think of drawing diagrams like this, which has been influenced by the general theory of relativity, that if you look at the node in a network, then you can always look to the past and find out the set of nodes at specific times that may have influenced the current node in some way. So nodes at times uh, uh, from which there is a path of events leading to this node at the present time. And you can also take a look at the future that, that now there is, for example, an infection sitting at node A, and these are the contacts that will happen in the future, and those are the contacts that will happen, happen after those contacts, then you will have this cone of influence, influence that the current node may exert on nodes in the future. So temporal networks constrain the flow of anything on the network. So if, if one, think of, one thinks of simple static networks as being some sorts of constraints that say a social network simply means that not everyone interacts with everyone else at all times, but people interact with the subset of others, then when you plug in time, you will have further constraints that, that people uh, interact with the subset of others at certain times, which then constrains what, what constrains what may happen in the network. Right. And besides these structural things that, that affect processes on top of, top of the networks, the times of the events themselves also do contain information. This is a plot from uh, Bluetooth contacts, timestamp Bluetooth con contacts of the data set that was released by Suna Lehman. When was it released? To about two years ago, uh, where they tracked uh, of the order of 800 students in Copenhagen who had, who had tracking software installed in their smartphones. And one of the uh, types of tracking they had was Bluetooth, con Bluetooth um, contacts, which is pretty much the same as all the COVID apps nowadays do. So if you take one student in this data set and plot that student's contact in time, and then you look at this diagram. This is already super informative. You see that there is a sort of daily rhythm that there are times when the students have more contacts than, than elsewhere, which is natural. These are the times when all the students are on campus. They are in classrooms, they are meeting one another. You can also read from this plot that there are some persons with whom this student is a lot in contact with. Especially there is someone that's probably, probably a boyfriend or a girlfriend with whom the student is in contact almost all the time. And then there are these random encounters, the people that, that are just, that they just pass by uh, on the campus. So a lot of information about the life of one student in this sim simple plot, right? And that's all in the times of contact. Right, so going ahead, this is what temporal networks are, they are, collections of nodes and events that have timestamps and basically uh, the interest in, the, in them is twofold that one would want to learn how the timings of events affect processes that take place on such networks and then the times themselves can all also contain a lot of information. So what have we learned by now? What do we know? Are we any wiser? wiser since we started doing this. Um, maybe the key, or one sort of key high level finding is that there's a ton of stuff happening. <laughs> there are very many inhomogeneities in the times of events. Uh, when we talk, about, especially when we talk about human behavior, either, either real world contacts or then digital contacts, phone calls, emails, whatnots, we see that there's a lot of temporal structure that we can use to understand people as, as individuals and also people as groups by looking at different timescales. 
And this time scale is one, one important thing here. When we look at networks with the timestamp interactions, there are things that take place at very short times. And then there are things that they take place uh, over far longer time scales. So this is just an illustration for some mobile phone call data where in, in the temporal networks, people are nodes and the events are calls between people. And then when you try to see what sort of, what sort of temporal animals you have in these systems, you have uh, at very short time scales, you have things like triggering events triggering other events, me calling someone and then that someone calling someone else within 10 seconds because of something I said. There are patterns, people A calling, B calling, C calling A, or chains of calls and chains of interactions. And then when we move to, to longer time scales, we'll start to see things like daily patterns that I believe Talaya is going to mention, mention later on, and weekly patterns, and then on longer time scales, we see how people's social networks change or do not change and so on. So things happen on many, many, many different time scales. And then, as I already mentioned, one of the interests in, in looking at temporal networks uh, is to understand how the, how the timings of events affect processes. As a simple, Example, this was something that was everyone was working on like 10 years ago, uh, which was discovered uh, independently and simultaneously by, by many groups at around that time, which is burstiness, which is uh, an, or the effects of burstiness on spreading phenomena. Burstiness is something that's very common to human interactions. Uh, it's simply, in everyday terms, it simply means that there are there's a lot of things happening, and then there's a long gap without any anything going on, and then there might be a burst of activity again, and then there might be another gap. So things are very inhomogeneously spread in time. I would send five emails to Mika today, tomorrow maybe none, then maybe maybe on Thursday one email, and then maybe after a week the next one, and so on. So the gaps are very heterogeneous. Now, if any information is spread is spreading. In, uh, on top of a network that has these gaps, then the existence of those gaps affects the speed of spreading and it makes, it makes that speed far uh, slower in the general case. So this was something that was, that was one of the early discoveries of, of temporal network studies. Um, nowadays, as, as of today, I think the most important application is uh, trying to make sense of the current pandemic and trying to understand the effects of different types of interventions. And this is typically based on Bluetooth or similar contact data or the social patterns RFID measurements uh, where people in some setting are tracked for, for a few days or, or a few weeks so that one can get the picture of how their contact structure is and how it evolves in time. We've, we've been doing some studies using, again, the Copenhagen data uh, in relationship to digital contact tracing, which is a thing where you really need the times of events. So, so people get sick, they infect one another, and then one tries to trace their contacts, hopefully early enough, so that you can actually isolate those contacts before they infect more people and so on and so on. So here, the time scales are, are, or using time information, temporal information is, is sort of important. So then a couple of ideas or thoughts about where is this all going? Now this, this um, epidemiological modeling, I already mentioned, so that's, that's something I, I'll, I'll be coming back to in a minute. Uh, Method-wise, if one looks at what people do with temporal networks today, is that they try to reduce all this complexity a bit because there are so many things happening at so many timescales 
And usually the number of events in any larger data set is so huge that in order to detect patterns, one has to somehow try to coarse grain it and simplify it. And this may also involve choosing the proper timescales that one looks at. For example, if we look at human interactions, the picture is totally different if we look at, at one hour intervals or if we look at one month intervals, you detect entirely different types of dynamics. So there are many ways, many ways that that are being are have been developed or are being developed to make the all this complexity a bit more manageable. And then there is still a lot of data-driven work going on. And today, really, the most important thing is basically epidemic models and models of interventions to spreading processes based on various types of contact data, uh, either direct such as, as in, in, in the social pattern set or the Copenhagen set, or then inferred, uh, for example, from the trajectories of people through hospitals that you know that, that, that they have been in the same ward or in the same room at the same time, and then you can kind of infer a contact network. Plus also human mobility as one factor. So where, where and how do people move? And then trying to combine the right level of cost training, the right level of information into models that, that help to understand what's, what, what uh, the best ways of mitigating uh, the spreading process would be, what, what, what the best in, uh, interventions would be in some cases to, to sort of simply understand the underlying physics of it also to, to understand uh, the theory of spreading in more detail. And I think I'm stopping here so that, that I can give the floor to Mikko. Or if someone wants to ask some questions or well, has some comments at this time, maybe we spend a bit of time on that and then we'll follow with the multi-layer things Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so maybe we should take a few questions. Um, for those on my side who are not familiar with the Copenhagen data, um, right. uh, that's a thousand cell phones given to students recording everything except uh, what they say. But so, so this is really very, very detailed, what's called reality mining data. Um, so yeah, that, that, thank you very much. This was amazing. Um, um, very cool. Um, are there some questions from the audience? I So one thing we can do is like, please put your questions uh, as they emerge in the chat. Um, and then uh, basically, uh, I can take them one by one or something. Um, maybe so there's no question I have one, which is um, this cone that you have just shown where you have yep from past to the future where the present is a point. Yep. Um, that present is more complicated, right? So there is some kind of, um, you know, component structure going on in the present. And so that picture, if one thinks about the present as something larger, like a network that is current, like the people sitting in this room yep. are, are a component where everybody can speak to everybody else. So yep. it's sort of like a strongly connected component. That makes one think of this famous picture of the bow tie diagram of the World Wide Web, where there is yes. a world of parallel communication and so on. So, mm -hmm. so what you draw is a really nice cartoon. But the question is, if we really measure it, how does this look like? Is there is there? <laughs> that's that's, that's, that's a point. crime. Yeah, yeah. That, no, no, that's that's actually that's a super important and difficult question at the same time. So, in the diagram that I showed, I the sort of present was one node, so mm -hmm. one single node in the network. And of course, in reality, you do have very many other nodes at the same point in time, right? Mm -hmm. They are not connected to one another at this point in time. They might be like an epsilon later, so there will be connections. And then how does, say, the future cone really look like? That's mm -hmm. like temporal component structure, right? So, so it's the same thing as in those bow tie diagrams and all that. So what you want to understand is, especially if you look at more than one node at, at the present time. So what you want to understand is that what parts of the world can you reach from this node at this point in time, right? 
Mm -hmm. And you may have super complicated structures. You may have structures that have same nodes appearing again and again and again, for example, which would mm -hmm. be, I don't know, a typical social relationship would be this, that mm -hmm. we sort of we interact, we keep interacting like towards the future. So, so the same nodes appear uh, at multiple times with links connecting. Mm -hmm. And then you can think of these templates. For example, now if we think of and this is something that I think a lot nowadays in the context of, of something like 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 uh, COVID spread. Now I can or this this would work also for information spread. Now suppose that yeah the situation we have here right now is that there are two groups research groups kind of meet, and these are structures that will persist in time, right? So all of us will be will be. Um, talking to one another in the future. So these are like temporal clusters that extend to the future. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of part of our future course. We could also have a situation where there's random passerby here. Yeah? So someone who just, I don't know, saw the Zoom link and decided to drop in. We don't know that person uh, necessarily, but there's some piece of information in what I say that this person kind of picks, right? and then transmits that to someone else, to someone else, to someone else, kind of outside this core cone of ours. So there are these tendrils that go out somewhere without us being able even to follow. And then if you think of this strong link, weak link structure of Granovector, but you think of that in time, so you have these, these clusters, these sort of densifications of the cone that are kind of connected by weaker pathways. And maybe some of these tendrils will come back to them in time. So you get a pretty interesting structure. This is how I visualize it, but, but I'm, I, I don't have many ways of quantifying quantify <laughs> it. Nice. OK. Um, work in the future. Um, nice. So there's no question in the chat. So Miko, um, stage is yours. OK, thank you very much. I will share my slides so can you see it yeah okay great yes so i'm gonna talk about multi-layer networks this I, I guess like it beginning of the part will be slightly overlapping what with what yari said but hopefully from slightly different perspective and also i have like tried to make this to be sort of short talk. So I will be skipping all the sort of technical details here. So we can talk about those later if, if you are interested. But right, so let's start talk about multi-layer networks. And sort of like this is now the similar part that Yari had. So so these like networks are everywhere and you know we are we are all very excited about analyzing networks. And sort of one of the things that I, I feel is like great about networks is that you can take these very many different systems and once you sort of project them into these graphs or networks, then you, they all sort of look the same. So you, you can analyze them with the same tools. You can find very similar structures in them. Uh, you can even like have models that are very similar that you can use across these different systems. So this is great. And this, this has been like, say last 20 years has, we have found a lot about these systems by analyzing this network. So this has been a very successful thing. So the abstraction where you have, have, a, have a network that is just like node, two nodes are connected or not connected. But then the question that has been asked, and this is again, we discussed this already a bit, is that is this representation enough? So if you, for example, now think about a social system, um, you could represent this like a like a network like this, where you have two people that are either connected or not connected, right? But in the in the social system, you actually have multiple different types of people. You have multiple different types of interactions. They, they things are changing all the time. And there's all sorts of things going on. So, are, is this really enough? So, can we like really uh, sort of? study social systems by, uh, by re representing them as simple or static uh, networks like this. And, and of course, the answer is that, yeah, sometimes we can. So we can, we can like find out many things by doing this. But in many times, this, this is not enough. But we, we want something new. Um, and in fact, in the literature, this has been like um, 
has been coming up over and over again, again that they have, there's this need to go beyond this single uh, simple uh, static network view, right? And especially in the application fields, often you want to include some sort of uh, uh, extra information. And here I sort of want to start by going through some examples and I maybe start bit from a bit older stuff than 2014 here. So, so these are, for example, social networks uh, that were collected in the 1930s. Uh, these are pictures from the book in the in a, in a 50s by, called Human Group. It's a quite a famous book at the time. And, and here you have a, have a network where, where the nodes are repeated across the different types of interaction types that people have. And you also have different types of nodes. So these are people who are working in a, in a factory. And then there was just a researcher who was like writing down all the kind of different kinds of interactions they had. So actually in this network, you would have six interactions. Here I'm just showing four. So there are things like men who got uh, into arguments with each other, men who played games together, men who were friends with together and so on. So these are, and in order to sort of analyze this system, the, the sociologists at the time were looking at this whole whole thing. So they're all of these networks, right? So not only a single network, for example, the friendship network. So these kind of ideas have been there for a long time. So not just focusing on sort of a single network, but having having multiple ones. Then when we go a bit further in the time, so this is now from this uh, social networks book, analysis book from the 90s by Wassermer and Faust, which is sort of influential book. And here you already have like, these are now called multivariate social networks. So these things have become a bit more formal. So you have multiple types of links in, in this kind of networks and, and sort of a mathematical way of representing these. Whereas in these sociograms, things were not like that. Then if we go uh, even a bit more to bit more complicated structures, this is a data set from uh, 87, where David Crockhart collected uh, this kind of uh, multidimensional social networks, where he had like two types of relationships between people, between 21 people, advice asking relationship and friendship ask, asking relationship. And then he also asked people to um, draw social net, net or sort of a mental image of the social network. So how how are the people perceiving the social network? So for every person in the network, they have a mental image of the of the social network that has two different types of relationship. So you can see that there's now like multiple dimensions here. So this was a really nice data set collected at the time in '87. Of course, this is a bit tricky to analyze, so not not that much was done at the time with this kind of data. Yeah, then there's obviously things like temporal networks that have come into picture and Yari was talking about those, so I'm not going to talk about them. Then there's this, uh, this sort of famous uh, network that Maxi also mentioned in the beginning. So uh, this is like the work by Howlin's group where they had two um, uh, different types of infrastructure networks. Uh, electricity network and a computer network, and they were interdependent on each other. So this could explain this kind of blackouts that happened in Italy, for example, where if one of the power stations failed, then some of the computers failed, and then some of the computers became isolated and more power stations failed and so on. So there was this cascading failure that was going on. So this was sort of a starting, one of the starting points in this like a more bit more modern way of looking at this kind of uh, networks of networks or networks with multiple types of uh, connections. And, and in this picture, it's also very clear that you cannot just analyze this system by looking at the single network because they're clearly in, interdependent. You need to have this information which nodes are in which networks. Um, yeah, you can of course like go beyond that in the infrastructure networks, you could think about how many different things are connected uh, or interconnected. So for example, the electricity network is connected to many other kinds of networks related to transportation uh, in, in, in addition to telecommunication and also other basic infrastructure. So sort of th there has been a lot of need for this. Uh, 
um, kind of more complicated structures of, of networks, so more adding more real, realistic things. And this is sort of in contrast to this first slide that I showed where everything was just a network, right? So, and we just analyzed them with the same, same tools. And this, is, this was some sort of a starting point where we were at uh, like around 10 years ago when uh, we wrote this uh, review article on something called multi-layer networks. So there was, the problem was that there were actually a lot of these kind of different concepts in the, in the, in the literature um, that were somehow within some literature trying to generalize the concept of graphs or these simple static graphs, right? And, and sort of everybody seemed to have their own pet uh, generalization. Like every group uh, had to come up with their own thing. So there were things like overlay networks, multidimensional networks, interacting networks. I mean, there's a lot, uh, and I will show you a table later. Uh, but the, the problem was that these were not really like we had lost this like uh, abstraction level where we could apply these to many many different kinds of systems, right? So, so overlay networks, for example, might have only been defined for social networks. And then these, uh, say, interdependent networks, we're analyzing uh, infrastructure. But in the in the but if you look a bit deeper, they were pretty much the same thing, with minor differences. They were also people defining concepts that were called different things for overlay networks and independent networks, but they were actually the same thing. And they were these fights in the literature at the time. I also remember in conferences being like in participating in these like seeing people like saying but this is what we did and already and it, it was because of this language a lot of that was because of this language that was a bit different as difficult to follow and um so so the thing that we wanted to do uh, was to think of that if there could be a, another abstraction that could be then used to sort of map all of these things into and then we could just work on this world of multi-layer networks right so so the so the kind of abstraction that would be general enough that it would would be able to carry all of these other things, but not too sort of abstract that you could still do something nice with it. And this is what the multi-layer networks sort of try to be. So here's a sort of a schematic picture of what the multi-layer network might look like. And so so the idea there is that so you have uh, nodes and links like in a normal networks or graphs but in addition you have this uh, additional sort of element with this layer so now you can see that the nodes are sort of organized on layers so you you put every node in a in a single single layer and but but, but there are a couple of things you should notice here the first one is maybe that the node in this representation can be repeated across the layers. So for example, this node one is in these three layers. Uh, you can have any type of links. So then they can be this kind of links going inside the layers. The node can even be connected to itself across the layers, or it can be connected uh, like somehow diagonally to other nodes in other layers. So any link kind of link is possible in this very abstract world that we are in. Then sometimes you want to have these kind of things where you have like two dimensions to the layering. So for example, uh, here you have this like uh, vertical and horizontal dimensions. And then you would, for example, call this layer, the layer AX, and this would be BX, and this would be BY, and so on. And this could, uh, for example, be that in the in reality or in the real applications, you could have like a interaction type on one dimension and uh, say time on the other dimension. So this would be a nice example of when you have this kind of thing. Okay, so this this is a sort of idea that we formalized and also others have formalized. Uh, I'm not going to go into the sort of the mathematical details now in this talk on this. We can talk about them later. later. And it turns out that this is sort of general enough so that you can actually map do this mapping to all of these different uh, all of these different concepts to multi-layer networks and this this is then what we did so we just went through all the different kinds of concepts so for example you could have something in the literature uh, where you have multiple types of connections 
between cities, so you would have multiple modes of transportation. So sort of mathematically, you would describe it in this kind of uh, edge scholar multi-graph, for example. But then we would just go ahead and map it as a multi-layer network where each, uh, each uh, edge type would become a layer. And then we just connect the, uh, the nodes across the layers. Uh, so, so you can do this kind of this kind of mapping on on this concept. So this is sort of usually very intuitive how how you do it. And once you do this, uh, this is uh, this is what happens. So here in this table, every uh, every row is one uh, network concept that we found in the literature. So now you can see that there's many many different names coming up. And then on the these um, columns here. So sort of what, what would be the features of these uh, concepts in the space of multi-layer networks? And this is defined in a way that if one row, or, sorry, if two rows have the same uh, sort of set of check marks and numbers and everything here, then these concepts are sort of equivalent so that you could take the uh, one concept transfer Form it into a multi-layer network and then transform it back to the other concept. So, so you could sort of uh, map, build a map between these concepts through the multi-layer networks. And so, if you stare at this table a bit more, you can see that there's sort of two main areas here where things seem to be roughly similar. Uh, so, the, the upper area here and these are usually roughly what is what are now known as multiplex networks in in many cases. And then the lower area, which is often now known as uh, networks of networks. So these are sort of the two types, but of course there's like a, it's not as clear when you once you go into the details. Another way of thinking about this is that these are networks where the uh, the links or edges have colors or types, and these are networks where the nodes have colors or types. So, so you have different types of nodes or different types of uh, links. Okay, so so this is the this is the picture so then um, on from the sort of a conceptual level. Then I could say a couple of things like just to give you an idea of what kind of things they are in reality. So, for example, social networks have been studied a lot uh, with with multi-layer networks and most commonly. They are uh, multiplex networks where you have, say, different connect different types of connections between the same set of people. Sometimes you could have things like like this, where you have, say, different actual uh, social networks where you create accounts, and then you could have multiple accounts on a, on one platform, and then these things could get a bit murky here. But uh, anyway, um, but there's also other ways of doing these uh, projections. You could think about transportation networks. Um, a typical example now would be this, that you had these multiple modes of transportation. But you could also think of other, other kind of things. Say, in one, within one uh, mode, you could have, say, uh, one vehicle or one line forming one layer, and, or one service provide, provider uh, forming one layer, and so on. So there's a lot of, lot of, lot of possibilities. Um, so, it's, so this is just to illustrate you what kind of things they are. Uh, I'm actually, I would have actually more of these slides, but I cut them out from this presentation. And uh, instead, I wanted to just give you some idea of the kind of things that I'm uh, currently working on, uh, a bit more close to applications um, uh, with, with relation to multi-layer networks. So um, this project is, is something that I've been working on for, for a couple of years now. Uh, this is together with, with some political scientists and uh, and communication scientists at the University of Helsinki, uh, where we are looking at this kind of political communication as, as a multi-layer network system. So here uh, you, you could think, for example, that um, previously people have been looking a lot at these single networks, for example, focusing how is the political communication, say, in social media. Or there's another type of literature where you look at policy networks, which are sort of this kind of networks between um, organizations that are to be quite small. There's also yet another literature that is looking at this kind of discourse networks in, in uh, like traditional media. 
but in in the end all of these are somehow connected and they are interacting each other so this is one way of looking looking at this communication system as a multi-layer network um, you could also like go inside one of these layers for example the social media layer and think about that as a multi-layer network where they actually for example you can think of these uh, different types of um, the, or different links as sort of aggregated uh, communication network where you just aggregate all types of communication together so so then um, then you want to disaggregate and look at this as a bit like a multiplex network and i'm going to show you an example of that so so this is for example uh, how uh, political twitter looked in finland in 2019 during the during the elections that we had um, so there were two elections uh, the uh, parliament elections and the european ele uh, the eu elections uh, and if you just collect and we, what we did is that we collected 300, 300 different topics together all political topics and and draw the network and this is how it looks like so there doesn't seem to be any stru structure here more specifically there doesn't seem to be any very strong polarization here uh, you might see that there's maybe something here that is a bit different from the rest of the network uh, but but it's it's not super strong so if you just aggregate everything together uh, it seems like there's there's not, not much going on here at least like at this kind of uh, very high level uh, picture but what happens if you then divide these into different topics is that completely different kind of picture emerges so uh, so for example if we only look at the discussion related to the green party or discussion related to the immig to immigration you can see that now you have clearly two bubbles uh, that emerge and you can pretty easily find these bubbles by doing uh, standard clustering methods so so what this means is that on the on the one hand at the aggregated level you have no polarization like everything just seems like this fur ball and at the individual topic level, everything seems to be like very polarized, or many topics seem to be very polarized. So now, what the multi, what we can do with the multi-layer networks is that we can look at, okay, well, how does this transition happen? Like, if what, what is there in between these two extremes? So we we can build multi-layer networks of these different topics and look at things like, okay, how many people are set between the bubbles? How are they? Are there some set of bubbles that are aligned and so on? And this is important, uh, for example, to understand how, polar how, how much polarization there is in the system. Because really, if you only ha would have like individual topics, that would be polarized. But people would sort of always have a um, sort of a dip different opinions, or the, the opinions wouldn't align in a way that you would always be on, on the same side with, uh, with, the, with the same people, then the polarization is not that much of a problem. But if it happens that you are always, there's two groups that are sort of separate and over multiple, multiple topics, um, then this, this can become a problem for the society because you, you will, uh, there will be no communication between these two sort of uh, super, super bubbles. Um, so this is, uh, like uh, this is what you can do i'm just see here showing you what will happen if you do this pairwise so if you look at how the how the bubbles are sort of aligned by looking at two topics at a time so the question i'm asking here is that if i know your bubble in one topic can i predict your bubble in another, in another topic and here i have sort of this kind of matrix between the topics and the topics now also include the, uh, the parties so for example here the brightest dot is this uh um the, the true Finns party and immigration which are the most aligned ones so here i can pretty sort of easily tell that if i know your uh which which bubble you are with regard to true Finns, then i also know um which bubble you are in regards to immigration so i know your opinion on immigration and vice versa uh, so so you can yeah so you can 
and you can do this for all the all the combinations and you can then start uh, sort of interpreting this which is what we do are doing with the political scientists other things you can notice here for example is that this national coalition party for example doesn't seem to be aligned with any topics so they are sort of not taking a stance here at least in the social media on on anything where some some other parties are aligned with some topics and so on okay so this is sort of what i had to say um, or had time for we can of course continue talking about this and especially the more technical topics if you are interested uh, just as a summary uh, so there has been a lot of work in this in this multi-layer network uh, literature but it has been very messy now it's it's a bit better i think people still use these words multi-layer networks and multiplex networks a bit like a, it's not always clear what they mean uh, but but this is definitely a framework that you can use to analyze this kind of uh, networks that have um, some sort of more rich information than just that if two nodes are linked or not uh, but but there's already a lot of work uh, and, and you can sort of borrow by going through this abstraction you can sort of borrow ideas from other parts of the literature so say you are interested in social networks you don't only have to stay within the social networks for the tools but you can use this more general framework that is applicable to more multiple different systems yep okay so bill do you have any questions on this Thank you very much first this is great um so maybe there is um again like you know you raise your hand or, or or put it in the chat um so thank you very much i think this you know this is uh don't don't worry if there's no questions right now i'm pretty sure this is like marinating in everybody's brain um this is things we um, those of us who come out of network sciences is, it's sort of exciting sort of like um it was a really nice summary of going to the current state where we are um but if you're if the background is not in network science this is shock and awe so uh Vyune. um yeah can you hear me yes oh okay good. um i was just wondering and i don't have that much network experience um but uh, what would be the difference between studying the same a uh, concept that has changed over time using term temporal networks and multi-layer networks where each layer would be a separate time period. Yeah, okay. I mean, I guess both me and Yari could answer this, but yeah, so there has been this kind of ideas and you can definitely do it. Uh, so so the, what, what is sort of typically done is that if you have like sort of this kind of coarse grained time, where you have aggregated a bit more together in a single layer so that actually the single layer is like some meaningful network, then you could use this kind of multi-layer network type representation. But if you would have this kind of very like a continuous time where for example, one layer could only have like one event or one link, then you would typically use this temporal network uh, approach. So it might be more fruitful for you. But in theory, you could sort of write down all the mathematics using multi-layer networks and it sort of work. But yeah, then if you, for example, if you in practice want to work with the computers and do this, then you don't want to, it's probably becomes very impractical. Yeah, if you have like, say, if you take, for example, our mobile, mobile telephone call data that has a one second time resolution and then you have data for six months, then, then the number of layers grows a bit too high. And many of those layers are very empty. So that's kind of the thing that then, then it's, it's sort of just a differential slice where you have a, two people calling one another or no one calling anyone. So, so that's kind of the, the problem when you go to, to the continuous time. But if you want to study daily aggregated networks, for example, which might be a very good idea, say, if you would want to do some epidemiological modeling with the type of data that that such as the Copenhagen date. It might be enough to have daily networks. And then if you just have 28 days or something, then it might be a good idea to actually use multi-layer. So it depends a bit on the resolution. Sorry, there's some hammering going on back in my apartment. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Just, um, 
actually in general this is it points to some kind of fluidity right it's like how how wide is my time window yeah. do i have a time window at all do i aggregate over time and yeah. stuff like that so so um one question i have uh, is uh, nico you actually divided the list of like the naming game into neat parts where you said okay this is networks with multiple colored links and this is networks with multiple colored nodes um, but as I said at the beginning, like we live in this world where, you know, you get these knowledge graphs uh, or databases where you have multiple node types and multiple link types. So um, is this a gap uh, or is this something which obviously you, it's like two genres of math you need to combine or, or is that something where you would say, oh, no, this already also exists and uh, you should look at XYZ? Yeah, so so to some extent you can do this with this uh, like multiple aspects in the multi-layer network. So you would have one aspect for the links and one aspect for the nodes, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's not much literature on that, and there's some depending on a bit on the network type. It might be also a bit cumbersome to do that. So yeah, so I, I would say that there's definitely like some work already on this kind of things, but not too much. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, yes, so Wikidata would be an obvious uh, culprit, something that can be dissected, I guess, some body on the street. <laughs> um, yes, um, there was somebody else. Because otherwise, I would say let's uh, continue with the lightning talk session. Thank you very much, Nico and Yadi. This was great. All right, who wants to go, go first? Volunteers. I can go first. Oh, or Javier, if you prefer, um, you, whichever is fine for me. Uh, it's the same for me as well. Like you can go first. <laughs> okay. Um. So I'm going to share my screen, I guess. I updated my Zoom, or no, I was supposed to update my Zoom and then everything stopped working. I just got it to work right before we started. So I hope that it still is working. So. It has been pushing these bloody updates. And this is like in half of the meetings, someone apologizes for their Zoom not working because of these pushes. So. Yeah, and the problem with it is that um, it doesn't let me update. It says that I have to ask the my IT admin. And yeah, so it's been, um, but let's see if I can get it to work now. It seems to be, um, okay. So the other issue that I've had is that when I share, do, do you see my screen now? Now I'm going to do play. Uh, do you still see? Uh, yes. So you see the actual full page. OK, very good. So I'm going to start. So I'm Talia Ludovud, and uh, I did my PhD with Yari some years ago. And now I'm a lecturer in computer science at Alto. I'm going to talk about, uh, well, so the title of my talk is very short, or I wanted it to be very short. It was from traces to rhythms, but then I realized that I'm not happy with the super short title. And then I added three more lines to it, which is how everything we do leaves traces behind and how uh, these traces can be used to quantify our behavior. So this is what I'm going to uh, talk to you about. And I'm just going to start with like some uh, very basic intro. Yeah. So everything we do in life just by living leaves some sort of traces behind. And uh, the simplest of all traces is, for example, our footprints. Like as we walk, especially if it's if, if it's on surfaces like sand or snow, uh, we leave some kind of traces behind. And just even by studying these simple traces of walking, we can learn a lot about an individual. We can see uh, like what is the size of their foot or their shoes, or, or we can learn specifics of the style that they walk or, or other, other like, um, like the anatomy of their feet and, and so on and so forth. And these are like very basic, but um, humans also like create other traces. Another very basic trace that we all produce is like our body has sense. And this is how, for example, dogs can tra track us. Or as we live, 
uh, we have to consume stuff, we eat stuff, we use other stuff, and, and we make trash. And our trash can also tell a lot of things about us. And there has actually been research done on, on studying trash and how much we can learn about people's behaviors and patterns and other things just by studying their trash. And then we can think of another type of uh, trace that people can leave behind. For example, think of a graffiti that somebody goes in, like uh, paints on a wall or writes on a wall or something like that. And uh, I wanted to kind of like draw your attention uh, a little bit to these different kind of examples that I gave. Um, and one difference between all these is that like, if you think about the first one, the scent uh, category, it's just that you have that just by being, you don't need to do anything extra, like your body has these scents. If you think of the trash, um, you basically, you are doing some stuff, you're eating, you're consuming different things. And just as a byproduct of that thing that you're doing, there is some traces that are being created about you or I don't know if it's, you can say about you, but, or like, yeah, related to you. And then if you think of the graffiti example, it's like a lot more intentional. You actually go and want to leave a mark somewhere. What I want to like tell you more about is our digital traces. So of course there are all these like digital world around us. There are all these devices and digital platforms. And in the same way as we interact with the, uh, physical world and we leave traces, also interaction with digital world leaves a lot of traces behind. And that's what we want to talk about now. Um, so the first level of uh, traces that I want to talk about, let's say um, on a platform like Twitter, you can go and write a tweet. And this is a little bit similar to that traces that I was talking to you in the physical space beforehand, like right, making a graffiti. So it's very intentional, you go and you leave a mark. Then uh, we have another uh, type, which is again, somewhat intentional, but like a little bit like a different level. I want to like um, say that this is a little bit more similar into that trash example that I gave is that you wear an exercise tracker for the purpose of, of counting your steps. And then there is data on how many steps you, uh, you had. So, uh, and then you can read this off. So this is also some sort of a data on you, less maybe intention go into it, but like there's still like some direct data on your activity. But then there is this other category of data that uh, can and is produced on people. And this is a kind of like more of a really byproduct of other things that you do with these devices and platforms. For example, as you make calls on your phone, there is also data being created on timestamps of these calls. Um, and you as a user might not really care about these timestamps, but they're being created nevertheless. Or for example, as you use these different digital platforms, uh, there can be, or there is data on how many times you log in per month, and this data can also be used. So basically, uh, digital traces that you leave behind, they can tell a lot about our behavior. And what I want to talk about here is basically how can these digital traces tell, tell a lot about our behavior. And I'm going to start with an example uh, that's from a study that now there were multiple mentions of it here already, uh, looking at smartphone data and uh, timestamps uh, from the smartphone data. And the behavior, oops, uh, the behavior that I want to, uh, I don't know why this, skip. yeah, the behavior that I want to talk about is some temporal patterns of activity. So a little bit about uh, temporal patterns of activity. Um, we know that everything we do, uh, we kind of like our body follows these um, night and day rhythm that is kind of dictated to us by nature. But also it has this social component that people like all the societies also run around this like night and day cycles. And uh, we are active usually during daylight and then we go to sleep at night. Um, and a lot of our bodily functions are also synced with this um, day and night rhythms. 
And what happened, and, and also like in the common culture, we talk about some people being night owls, meaning that they don't go to sleep until very late and they wake up late. And then we have early birds who do the opposite. In um, the chronobiology literature, these kind of different categories of people that they have tendency to be active at different hours of the day, they are called different chronotypes. What I have tried to do here is try to infer these chronotypes or different categories of people based on their digital traces instead of using the conventional method of using questionnaires uh, that is usually done in chronobiology. So I'm not going to go uh, into the details of this study because already today we talked about it multiple times, but the, the data that we uh, used for this study is uh, from the Copenhagen Network study, so that famous study that uh, you already know about. So the types of data that uh, I have looked at in this study, uh, from this study, is um, the timestamps of a phone screen on and off. So basically every time a person's phone screen has turned on, we know what time that has happened. And, and then also timestamps of uh, calls. So using that data, what we have tried to create uh, here is kind of a weekly rhythm of, of the person's activity. And by activity here, we are talking about like that phone being turned on. And if you look at this uh, thing on, on the, in the bottom, uh, this is basically what we did is that we kind of take one week here, I just show the first six time bins, but this like it goes up onto 168, so seven times 24 hours. And uh, for each day, we have 24 time bins, and we take the data from one individual for a whole year. And if that's the data point, so that timestamp of phone screen turning on is on a Monday between hours three to four, doesn't matter which Monday of the year, we add one event to this bin three to four of Monday. And if it's from five to six on Monday, we add one to there. So we just aggregate the whole data for a, for a whole year and a person like this. And in the end, we divide these numbers by the total number of events that one person has. So we kind of normalize and we end up having a distribution like you see up here. And, and as we can see in the late hours, so at the night hours, this distribution goes low, meaning that there has been very little activity there. And during like some hours of the day, this goes up. And already by looking at this, we can get some idea of um, what are the active hours and what are like the low activity or sleep hours of a person. This uh, plot, uh, specific plot that you are seeing here, this is like the average behavior, average rhythm of the everybody in the study. So, but we can do the same thing for each and every individual. And uh, this is an example of uh, two individuals in this study. Uh, the top one is a night owl. As you can see, this person is much more active than the average. The average is like the uh, thinner line, which is like black or gray. This individual is much more active than the average. Uh, in the late hours of the night and much less active than the average in the early hours of the day. And the bottom one, this is a morning person and has the exact opposite behavior. So just by looking at individual uh, rhythms and compare it to the average activity rhythm of the whole population, we can somehow infer the chronotype of a person without asking them any questions. So just by their digital traces. And then as a next thing, uh, what we did is that we also looked at the social network of these people based on the calls that they make to others. And um, so for each person, we look at how many uh, social contacts they have. And what we can see is that night owls tend to have a much larger social network. So if you look at this plot on the left, we can see that night owls, uh, compared to those early birds or larks, have much uh, like higher personal networks. And also because a lot of these students were like, they were all incoming students in a university and there many of them were friends and in touch with each other. We could also build a social network of students um, 
And, and this is what you see on the right side. And the blue dots are the night owls and um, the red ones are the larks. And we can see that um, the night owls are basically much more central in the social network of students. So what we did is that we took these digital traces off people's phone and we could learn something about their behavior, about their activity rhythms. We could learn something about their social behavior and eventually we could also tie all this together and learn something about that as well. One more thing that I want to also briefly mention is um, I also do research where um, we, uh, we kind of collect data from certain types of like subpopulations. And a lot of my work has been about individuals with mood disorders. So uh, mental health is one of my main uh, research interests. And we have been running uh, this um, study with individuals with mood disorders for, for a few years now. And in this study, in addition to smartphone data, we also collect other types of data like actigraphs, which are similar to exercise trackers, and also bed sensors, which are these, uh, you can see them on the right. These are these small devices that you can uh, put under your mattress. And first of all, they can measure the timings of your sleep, but also a lot of uh, different physiological uh, parameters like heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration rate, and so on and so forth. And here I just show one very basic plot from based on the research which is uh, related to sleep and rhythms again and um, what we did here is that we look at the um, uh, bed sensor data and we look at the average rhythms for patients and also in this study we have healthy control so we can compare the two groups and um, so the patients are the orange ones and the healthy controls are the blue ones. And what we can see is that patients tend to wake up much late on average, much later than the healthy controls. And also they tend to have these sleeping hours during the day, uh, unlike healthy con controls who most likely are going to work or study and cannot be um, sleeping during the day. So this is just like a very, uh, like in the in, in uh, kind of group level behavior, already we see some difference, but also we can dig deeper into individual level and learn something about the behavior of people uh, who have, for example, certain mental health disorders. So this is all I wanted to talk about today. Thanks a lot. And if you have questions or want to discuss anything in more details, I'm of course happy to do that. Thank you very much. Um... This, I, I'd like to emphasize that there is this kind of thing that um, when we talk about temporal and network patterns, so this can be taken to longer time ranges if we would have the right data, right? Which is always the big yeah. problem. So thank you very much. This was a really good example. Uh, Mila has a question. Yeah. Who's also from Helsinki and in Helsinki. Oh, yeah. Nice. yeah, greetings from Helsinki. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I uh, Well, I just want to thank all of you for, for your talks. I, I think this is super interesting. And I just, uh, I, I just think that I, I have so many kind of like really detailed questions that I'm kind of like, I'm just now in the face of enjoying everything that you have to give and, and then maybe later. But here I, I really wanted to um, maybe ask or uh, tell... Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, so I think that it's, uh, you know, my, yeah, my background is in cultural history. So I'm coming mm -hmm. from another kind of like temporal, maybe networks or, or things. Um, and I think that um, I could really relate on the way you describe um, that kind of like that there are traces that we leave behind. And it's important for us to think how these traces actually tell about us as humans. And I, uh, I really enjoyed. And, and I, I think that um, I, what I wanted to ask um, is that uh, in relation to, because you told that you have been tracing the, also the telephone calls of these, uh, uh, these uh, people in the Copenhagen uh, data. Um, and, and you looked at the uh, social networks based on, on the telephone calls. So um, I have been thinking of my own uh, telephone usage and I can see from my own telephone that when I have been in, in um, kind of like maybe in the same place with some persons, of course, 
I call them less. And, and when I go somewhere else, then I, I might be calling to these persons, you know, when they are not here in the same place where I am. So just kind of like, um, I'm just kind of like thinking, did you or um, how, how do you think about kind of like uh, using this one, um, one kind of data like telephone calls, how much uh, you can, um, there is that you can, you can say about the kind of like centrality of a person in a network based on, on this um, maybe one layer uh, or do you have uh, in this data set um, maybe other data concerning like maybe social media usage or, or some others of kind of like uh, to, to kind of like think about uh, like different layers of these, um, these social networks here. Yeah, yeah but... this is actually a very good point. And uh, this is something that I usually address in longer talks, but here, obviously, I wanted to keep it short. But a really, really good point that uh, nowadays we tend to use so many different like ways of communi communicating one another that maybe just looking at calls is not that informative anymore as it used to be. Uh, this study was run already like five, six years ago. And back then, uh, I actually visited the group for two months. So I spent some time with them and, and tried to learn more about the participants in the study and all. And they told me that back then, I'm still like using call texts and, uh, and SMS among that population was a very common thing to, to reach out to one another. Uh, but as especially as time passes and there are more and more platforms, this is becoming like a less and less reliable source if we want to have a full picture of an individual. And that's why um, in the Momomut study that, for example, I showed you uh, in the last slide, um, we have uh, these kind of, uh, on the phone, we also collect things uh, like their app usage and, and things like that. And um, in a paper, which I think I, now it's on archive, I think I had it here. Um, yeah, maybe you could um, have a look at that if you're interested. Uh, we kind of try to show how we can combine these different sources um, and, for example, find one measure of sociability, we call it there, and, uh, and try to combine, for example, different measures for sleep or activity because one device or one data stream does not necessarily give us a full pic picture of, of an individual. Thank you very much. I think there's one thing which I think is a, is a, is a, is a big issue that um, probably be on the culture, humanities, um, cultural studies uh, side, even the quantifying ones need to sort of adopt more and more, which is this, this idea that basically everything is just a statistical or probabilistic sample. So, so it's not like that the sum of, every, of all the measurements you have sums up to the relation between two people. But basically, if you have five phone calls of person X in week one and 50 in uh, week two, maybe they just had another phone in week one, <laughs> which may perfectly be feasible, right? So, so that's something which we always need to take into account. It's particularly important as we go back into cultural history, because history, as you go back in time, you get exponentially less data, which has has to do with the fact that we exponentially, uh, produce exponentially more shit in, on Earth, but also has to do with the fact that uh, sort of our traces decay as we go back. And so that is a really important kind of thing, I think, to, to take into account. And um, I, I remember uh, I was sitting beside Sune for a couple of years uh, at Borobasi Lab uh, there was this moment when Google uh, said, like, uh, you know, we need all the data and Wired was like um, featured featuring this cover, which says get naked, like basically all the data. No, there's no privacy. And and I called BS on, on Zune when, when this happened. And he said at this point, he said, like, no, 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 there will be all the data. And then at some point he, he became very reluctant with this. And, and he, he made this change where he said, like, you know, we cannot, hey, we cannot have all the data because it's not PC. But on the other hand, no matter how much you have, it's not all the data. That's the key point, right? And so I think that is something that is super important to take into account. And so all the data simply doesn't exist. And then the question is, how do we work with probability and how do we actually deal with this? 
And in history, this is particularly difficult because the number of samples we have are way less than we have in the Copenhagen data, which is in that sense, a really neat toy data set, which I can, you know, this is like, this is, thank you very much for bringing this to the table here because uh, even though this is not strictly like sort of cultural history there or something, it's very important to look at these dense current data sets so we can actually even talk about older stuff. I think it's super important. We have 32 minutes to go. Um, so um, there was another one who was Javier, right? Is that, um, yeah. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing. I see Andre, uh, Andres has a question. I'm going to answer that in the chat so we uh, yeah. can move on. Thank you. Which is a good question, though. <laughs> so everybody take a look. Yeah. And uh, I will share my screen. Yeah. So hi, everyone. My name is Javier Urena Carrion. And uh, I will, well, my talk is titled Communication Then and Now, Analyzing Epistolar Datasets and Communication Networks. And uh, basically, the idea is that uh, we had access to this uh, very rich uh, historical epistolar datasets. And so probably some of you know this uh, better, but uh, letters are a prime source of historical research. But uh, these data sets have been traditionally, in a way, like decentralized. So um, they are curated by historians, and they usually focus on one or two, uh, or two people. And then, of course, um, it is very hard to systematize this data because it is, as I said, curated, uh, usually letter by letter. And so it is uh, not really easy to know uh, how, um, yeah, how like this uh, data is generated or how like how to how how this data behaves. Uh, however, there have been a lot of recent developments in uh, digital databases, and so there's been a, a lot of efforts to compile uh, this um, Hercule Herculean efforts by historians and uh, access these letters in uh, digital databases. And um, so the thing of our project is that once we had some of this data, we were wondering, okay, so this is evidently a communication network. So this is a network of letters of uh, people, yeah, just people sending letters to one or several people and, um, and then like people answering back. And so to what extent can we apply this uh, known communication network methodologies to epistolar data sets? And um, so um, basically the idea of this project is to look at different, uh, different aggregations and see basically how this uh, different networks, uh, well, how this communication networks differed. And so what we'll be looking at is uh, very similar to what Yari was talking about, of how different uh, uh, ways of looking at time can alter the, the network analysis. And so first we go through uh, structural features. And so this is basically just looking at static graphs and seeing, okay, so how does the degree distribution look or how um, is this network or like, is it structurally, structurally very different from modern uh, communication data sets. Um, then we'll go to communication patterns. And so this is more looking at uh, pairwise interactions and how, yeah, so how do people communicate and uh, what can we tell from this? And this is not only related to behavior, but also to how uh, these dyadic interactions relate to the network topology. And uh, the last part is uh, focusing on ego networks. And so this is basically, since this is since a lot of these uh, historical data sets are collections of ego networks, then the goal is to see how um, how how traditional or like how uh, known methodologies for analyzing ego networks uh, play into uh, this epistolar data sets. And um, so the data set that we are analyzing is a chorus church data set. And this is a digital database, uh, database that is mainly centered in Germany. And uh, so the idea is that this uh, goes from the 16th century to the 19th century. So this is four centuries worth of uh, data. 
And uh, we have more than 100,000 letters uh, sent between 20,000 individuals. So in, in a way, this is a very large data set um, for, the, um, for the context of historical uh, letters. But at the same time, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very special data set because it is uh, emphasizing different people, well, very specific people. And uh, then we compare this, this data set with other, with other data. So we're looking at very, uh, at very different social networks that are modern examples. So we have like one Facebook uh, network, then we are looking at two email networks. One of them is Enron and the other we just call email, uh, but both of them are email networks and it's basically uh, emails within a company. And, um, and the last one is, uh, it's called Forum and it's an online community that spans a period of seven years. And uh, so as you can probably see, uh, or the definition of what is a connection is actually quite different in, in, all of the, in all of these different data sets. But the idea is that in many cases we can see very consistent behavior. And if it's not consistent, we can see, or we can uh, understand why it's not the case. And um, so first, the, I hope that this doesn't come off as just like a collection of uh, very random graphs, but the idea is of course, to go uh, through all these uh, different aspects that I was mentioning. And so we'll be looking first at the, at the structural features. And so uh, first uh, we'll be looking at the degree distribution and uh, eigenve eigenvector centrality. And uh, the main thing that I want uh, to showcase, showcase in this case is that um, these epistolar data sets are collections of ego networks. And so, so in this case, we do have, and this is something that we see very clearly, that we do have uh, nodes that are more important or overrepresented in the network. And so just by looking at the degree distribution, we find that 78% of the nodes in the CORESP search uh, data sets have a unitary degree. So in a way, like only 20% of the nodes uh, start having, uh, well, participate in the whole degree distribution. And at the same time, uh, when we look at the reference data sets, we see, well, this is a whole, uh, a whole area within network science, whether, you, whether or not you see a power law. But uh, what we see in this case of this uh, epistolar data set is that we see a slight increase uh, within the higher degrees, degree nodes. So the, the way that these uh, networks decay is not exactly the same. And this is because some nodes are more important. And then when we look at, at different uh, centrality measures, so centrality measures is basically a way of, uh, of seeing how, uh, how important certain roles are, uh, cer certain nodes are. And um, eigenvector centrality is uh, basically, well, in, in a nutshell, it tells you how well-connected nodes are connected to other well-connected nodes. And um, in this case, we also see uh, that there is a very small number of highly central nodes in the network. And so um, structurally, this, this uh, epistolar uh, data set is, as I mentioned, overrepresenting certain people. But um, however, if we look at uh, communication features, now we're not only, well, we're, we're looking at ties, not just spe at specific people. And uh, what we find is that is uh, quite interestingly, interestingly consistent behaviors. And so for instance, when you look at the number of contacts, you see uh, a very, yeah, like very consistent decay in the distribution. And uh, something that is quite remarkable of these data sets is that we like this data set spans complete lifespans. So in many cases, the pairwise interaction might occur during a period of 20 or 30 years. And so this has, this gives us access to quite uh, unique insights because usually uh, communication data sets are restricted to very short uh, periods of time. So at most one or two years. But since, since in this case, we observe uh, communication for several decades in some case, we can actually see how this communication uh, decays. Yeah, so it usually 
um, it usually has a cutoff because at some point people um, might start uh, dying. But um, then we look at other measures of communication. And so this is, uh, this is the idea of, uh, well, this is interevent inter -event time. And so the idea here is really related to what Yari was mentioning, that you might send, uh, you might communicate with someone one day, uh, five times during a day, and then you might wait for one week. And then like, the, the following communication might be just uh, two, two communication events during a month. And so um, the idea that, that we see, see here is that uh, in this case, we see a very consistent decay uh, in the inter-event time distributions, um, which is in a way good news because it tells us that, uh, that yeah, that <laughs> people communicate in a, in, a, in a relatively consistent way. But something that is quite interesting is that um, this is this idea of burstiness. And so the burstiness is um, that th this behavior where people might communicate is these short, short bursts and then have a longer waiting time. And so in modern communication uh, data sets, there tends to be slightly burstier behavior. So in, in this plot, what we see uh, above zero is slightly burstier behavior. And around zero, this is uh, basically random behavior. So uh, Poisson and behavior. And um, below zero is more regular behavior. And one of the differences that we see between these two data sets is that uh, in modern communication, we usually have the burstier, burstier dynamics, whether in these uh, historical cases, we have uh, much more um, anti-bursty behavior. And uh, so this might be due to people just communicating a bit more regularly than we do nowadays. Um, then we look at a whole different aspect, and this is the idea of linking behavior with topology. And so uh, the idea of the Granovder effect is that there are uh, topological differences between strong and weak ties. And so strong ties are usually located around circles of friends. So uh, if we have a strong tie here in red, then um, the common neighbors of these two people are also uh, uh, friends among themselves. Um, well, are friends to the other two people, sorry. And uh, however, when you are looking at uh, weak ties, uh, then these ties usually serve as inter-community bridges. And so what we do here is that we compare uh, this idea of uh, overlap. So we measure uh, how, yeah, like the topology of the, like the amount of circles in a way uh, of friends. Uh, we, we compare it to the strength of a tie. And uh, to, of course, you cannot observe how strong a tie is directly. And so you need to use proxies. And so we can use many of this, uh, of these communication patterns that we showed before as proxies for tie strengths. And what we see here is that we indeed have a Granovator effect uh, going on in place. And so for instance, this uh, W is uh, the number of calls that we have. And here we have the overlap. And on average, um, when you increase the number of calls, you also increase the overlap. Um, and so what we see is that strong ties indeed are collected with uh, are located within this community of people and uh, this happens across different centuries uh, but also it happens across different aggregations uh, of time um, but then again we can also look at different proxies of tie string and so for instance we also have burstiness and so we have that the bur burstier styles are also associated to higher overlap and so usually in this case burstier ties are uh, indicative of a higher, um, in a way, tie strength. And of course, uh, another thing is that uh, this idea of temporal stability. And so if, if people have had contact for a, lo a longer period of time, then we can also find that they are located within uh, certain communities. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, and one of the last things that I want to talk about is uh, this idea of social signatures. 
And so this is trying to see how people's behavior change within uh, or changes or not within the observation period. And so um, actually uh, this idea was uh, developed uh, a lot by uh, Yari and uh, but also Sarah in our research group, uh, Sarah Hader has been working a lot on this idea. And so here, what we look at is at uh, ego network communications. And we see that um, eagles usually communicate more with certain, uh, with cer certain uh, neighbors. And so we can rank these neighbors and we can see, you know, we, we can uh, determine a signature just by looking at the ranks. And so this, uh, this social signature just looks at how much communication you're devoting to uh, your top uh, person and then to your second top and then how this, uh, how this decays. And so um, the idea is that we, com we can compare a, a person's signature to their own signature during different times. And to know whether this uh, whether these signatures are more consistent within themselves that, than towards others, then we can look at uh, the distance between uh, the signatures to other people. And so, usually, what uh, what uh, well what has been found um, is that the 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 social signature tends to be. Um, more similar to one, one person across different time periods than to other people's social signatures. And uh, what we have found here is that uh, in this, um, in this community, uh, sorry, in this epistolar data sets, um, the social signature uh, also does exist. And so the distance between, um, well, the distance distribution uh, for social signatures uh, for own people is usually way smaller than when comparing to other people. And uh, not, not only that, but we can also see that uh, it doesn't matter uh, if, um, if we are looking at, um, well, sorry, uh, the alters themselves. So like who is the, the most, uh, the top ranked alter of one person also changes. Um, and this changes usually a lot across different times. And so this is just an example of, um, of what is the set of neighbors of different social signatures. And so here we have two years intervals. And so we're looking at one person's uh, signature for more than 20 years. And then the color indicates uh, how similar are the neighbors of these people. And usually what we see is that across, um, across uh, similar, well, in adjacent time, time periods, then we see uh, similar neighbors, but the neighbors usually uh, decay a, a, a lot. And so at different at, uh, times that are uh, <laughs> like really separate in time, then the neighbors are not the same. And um, so as a discussion, uh, what I have been talking about is that uh, these communication networks, these uh, epistolar, uh, epistolar data sets are, are in a way um, very similar and still quite different from uh, communication data sets that we, that we know. And so in global network behavior, uh, it is relatively hard to analyze because there's a small minority of overrepresented and hi highly central nodes. However, uh, the local behavior of, of these data sets is quite consistent with known results. And so we can see the Granovator effect where, str where strong ties are related to circles of friends. And we also have the social signatures where we can see that people communicate in very consistent ways throughout their lifetimes. And um, now we have been in talks with uh, some historians from uh, from other research groups and to see what they think of this research and uh, how um, what directions they think that are interesting. And um, so nowadays we're, we're working on this uh, new directions and it's it's a bit related to how communication differs during a lifetime and what can we say about the openness or closeness of community uh, of communities. And um, yes, thank you. This was my talk. I... Thank you very much. This is great. Um, yes. Um, so 
There's no direct questions in the chat, but uh, whoever has some, please put them there. Um, I have I have a, I have two questions. One is more a comment. Uh, in the original uh, Burstinus paper, if I remember well, the there is actually an effect described for Darwin, where he has sort of you know as he gets more famous, uh, there is a, a below threshold situation where he has like very regular communication, and then at some point <laughs> he's flooded by fan mail and hate mail. And from then moment onward, he becomes super bursty and like only every third Friday he answers his mail or something like that. So I wonder if your more regular communication pattern in historical times has to do with this thing that most people probably were on the threshold um, in their letter writing. While people, you could probably look at the people who are dense, like Voltaire or whatever, or in this case, I don't know who the Archbishop of Mannheim. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so do, you, do you see different people where are some are bursty and some are not? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely there's these differences uh, between, uh, between different ties. So we're looking at burstiness at level of ties, not necessarily at uh, the level of, uh, of people, which uh, of course we can do it. Um, but yes, actually uh, one of these uh, new directions or one of the possibilities is to look at how um how once uh how yeah the burstiness might change uh, across different time periods especially for these relationships that uh last for several decades then uh, we might expect to have different measurements if we look at different uh if we focus on different time periods yeah yeah i've done some tests like this is very long time ago with like the mentioning of objects uh, in documents and uh, there you get similar things that you have like you know you, you go from like sort of like some random noise and then as you walk up you have some situation in the middle um like if you look at particular roman emperor for example you may have some really weird um temporal signal with some burst whatever which may be spurious at this point but if you look at um augustus who is super frequent like who has like 30 percent of all portraits you get a more interesting temporal pattern. While if you look at Roman portraits, all of them summed up, you will have sort of like some baseline. I mean, there's still some modulation, but so the, so the key thing is these kind of like aggregations. I think it's, it's, that this ties back to to what Yari said at the beginning. Wouldn't it be nice if we knew all these uh, what do you call it um, these temporal animals? <laughs> Next sort of, word, temporal animal. Yeah. Yeah. So art historian George Kubler called this, there must be some kinds of durations. And so, so that would be something where I think uh, there would be, there's a lot of overlap um, in many different ways. So there's probably as different a thing going on as between temporal, uh, multi-layer, multiplex, multi-dimension, whatever. So there's many different uh, projects going on on our side that have these temporal issues. But one thing I would be really interested in is exactly this kind of thing. Like what are the temporal like what are the kind of distributions we find and uh, how do these change as we look at them differently because if we aggregate up there is like bzz, well if we at the bottom we have some interesting sort of like you know something that sounds like a geiger counter <laughs> or or something that sounds like a bursty process um so so that is quite interesting so the discussion in the background between uh Talea and andres uh, has percolated uh, there, there's a back and forth, uh, so um, they agree that this is like a very important issue um, to look at sleep patterns, um, which um, the, the question is, is it, um, are night owls disadvantaged in the same way that uh, women um, are disadvantaged because the seatbelts of cars are developed for men? Uh, please solve that question because I'm a night owl. <laughs> yeah, I'm also a night owl and I keep always thinking that the world is unfair towards us. Uh, so <laughs> I have very good motivations to do this research. Nice. Mila, raise her hand. Yeah, again, super interesting. Thank you, Javier. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of... <laughs> I, I would have a lot of questions. I'm, um, 
I'm, I'm uh, focusing in my research in circulation of knowledge and I have been looking at kind of like 19th century news, uh, kind of like spreading of news and currently I'm looking at um, circulation of pseudo historical discussions in the Russian uh, language internet or World Wide Web and so on. Uh, but this touches kind of like lots of um, interesting things that I have been looking at and I'm willing to look at also. I just kind of like, uh, I wanted to ask about this data um, that you have uh, regarding these epistolar uh, correspondences. So uh, do you, does it also, so does it kind of like, um, like the dates that you have there, are they kind of like, is there like the dates when the letter was sent or when it was received? And, and can you also see the kind of like, how long time did it take for, for a letter to, to arrive? Or have you been kind of like looking at what are the, so the metadata, so what is the date there signifying? Yeah, it's usually the date where it was sent. And I mean, like, there's a, a lot of variability because it's, these are collections of different uh, data sets. And so it does depend. Uh, some, in, in, in some cases, we do have access to when it was uh, received. But in most cases, it is only when it was sent. And there was, of course, the situation where we don't really know the exact date when it was sent. So we have uh, an approximate idea. Um, so it, this varies a lot. And uh, so, of course, uh, the data quality is one of the issues of this uh, research. OK, so I have to cut this short. I, I almost wanted to go around and say, like, let's have the group members of Kudan do the very same thing that Mila just did. But I have to point you to the home page uh, because um, Yari just um, told me there is another short talk by Tsirin Huang. And so we never met face to face, but we're co-authors, which is quite nice, right? <laughs> so, so we had a lot of stuff going back and forth. So I'm very much looking forward to that one. So um, um, to the rest uh, of the audience, please check out the Kudan group on the website. And we will totally give the reverse favor if so desired. And I hope so. Yes, Siren. OK, I will share my screen. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Zhi uh, Yuanhuan, and yeah, and my current research work uh, includes uh, two projects. The first one is public transportation network analysis. As Yari and Mikos mentioned before, uh, the public transportation network could be represented as temporal network or multi-layer network. So I try to like compare the uh, PTM of different cities and try to understand uh, like the different design guidelines of different cities, like for some like Europe's uh, cities or maybe some American cities. And in other ways, we can use those uh, public transportation network data set, such as like the uh, GTFS data, the schedule information of public transportation network, and try to solve some practical issues, like to optimize the vehicle frequencies of the PTM. Especially current, we facing the pandemic uh, situation and uh, schedule of public transport has been like changed a lot. And then we also try to understand when the uh, PTM changed, what was the impact on the traffic demand and how to like to forecast the travel demand. And the second project is generative mobility network. Although there are some like famous theoretical models such as gravity model or radiation model, but there are still some problems. Like those models are has have a problem of underfitting, especially within the city. And the traffic uh, and the mobility patterns within the city has some like community uh, features 
um, like loss of mobility flow as a like an obvious uh, direction, like um, from the rural area to the uh, to the center area, and then go back to home, like some home and workplace issues. So currently, we try to combine some real time traffic count data and also some uh, scheduled data to estimate the temporal mobility patterns within the Helsinki area. And currently, I found an uh, interesting uh, data set, uh, which is from the Erasmus program. This program contains of uh, contains like more more than 5,000 um, organizations such as university or institutes covering uh, 34 countries and more than 2,000 cities over six years. Um, yeah, and they are like more than 100, 1 million students involved in this program, um, more than like 250,000 teachers and staff also participate in this program. And um, yeah, I um I check some like some some uh, characters of this data set. Like we can see um, the student mobility is more unequal than teachers' mobility or staff mobility. We can find it seems like the organization in the UK or in the uh, North Europe has more activities activities for the student for those exchange students. Okay. Yeah. And I also check the mobility network uh, according to different like subjects or the students. I don't know like professional backgrounds. Um, we can see like the students mobility network in different subjects has like different patterns they are different hubs the um, these red dots present they are like large outflow oh sorry <laughs> like have large uh, inflow and those blue dots uh, represent the largest like outflow um, yeah, 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 it's an example in terms of like um, graphic la uh, layout. Yeah. Um, we can also check the temporal patterns, like uh, from different years, we can see the hubs shift with the time. Yeah. And, and here is a, like a summary. Um, for this uh, data set, we could use like Weightiest network or maybe temporal network and multi layer network try to model the uh, the Erasmus uh, mobility net, uh, data sets. And then by using this data set, we might be have uh, opportunity to understand like the relation between the Erasmus program and some innovation in within the Europe, uh, European countries, or maybe the Erasmus uh, mobility network could be as a, like a process, like maybe for like immigration uh, mobility network. Or we can also try to rank the organization basis on the mobility network and, and something like that. Yeah. yeah, that's all, thank you. Thank you very much. There is uh, there is no greater um, um, praise than people picking up on someone's fingers. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is amazing, and uh, I love that you see all these different patterns if you look at the different genres. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that that is that is really interesting that there is different patterns coming out. 
um, and the question is if they're systematic and persistent over time, if they are, then this is like super cool. And if we can find this on a larger level, I get goosebumps thinking about this. <laughs> so so that, that is really cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, so yeah, I hope this, this connection between uh, the two cities and between network science and cultural data analytics continues and we do lots of different projects together. Um, so um, yeah, please let us know when we should talk about what we are doing. Um, and I hope the pandemic ends pretty quickly. We are all vaccinated and then we can go back and forth. Yep. So um, thank you very much. We ran out of time. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So <laughs> we'll be in touch and, and, and we'll, we'll plan for a re-invite at, at some point, maybe possibly after the summer holidays when the, when the autumn season starts, that could be a very yeah. good time. And also if we have other interesting seminars in our group coming up, we can always keep sending you the links and invite you over it's very easy to, to mingle in, in, in such seminars now because of Zoom, so no one has to travel exactly. anyway. So you could just, at the moment, swim can join another group seminar, and we are very open for that.